The best concept is always the simplest one. We created the playbook for the kind of work that is possible to do in live events, and that's a very tempting target. What I love about my job is that I can walk away from any part of it at any given time. Hello, and welcome to the Theatre Art Life podcast, sponsored by ClearCom. ClearCom is the leader in voice communication since 1968 for theatre and the performing arts. When the show must go on, ClearCom is there to keep the team on cue. The Theatre Art Live podcast puts the spotlight on those who create live entertainment around the world, the culture creators and the backstage masters. My name is Anna Roth. Today we're talking with Josephine Lawrence. Josephine is a director, producer and founder of Orion Unlimited Production Agency. Josephine has a 30 plus year career spanning across theatre, film, live events and visual and performing arts. She has produced over a thousand projects in the last 20 years, designed, built, choreographed, and staged, and toured internationally with some of the biggest names in the respective industries Louis Vuitton, Stella McCartney, Chanel, Sting, National Geographic, Liberatum, Juno Mac, MSN, Hong Kong Ballet, City Contemporary Dance Company Hong Kong, and the Hong Kong Philharmonic. Josephine has staged Louis Vuitton in the Forbidden City, Chanel on a Rooftop, filmed in the mountains of Vietnam, created a theatre presentation for Chanel. Uh, Alexander McQueen, Combs de Garçon, and during the pandemic brought the Hong Kong film, theatre, music and ballet industries together for a multidisciplinary collaboration on 13 original shows. Josephine is known for directing projects on any scale with an attention to detail, high production values, intelligent and highly original content that deliver media-worthy, engaging, immersive experiences on budget and on time. I love the on budget person part, by the way. Josephine, welcome to the show. (laughs) Good morning, Anna. Thank you for inviting me. Excellent. So I want to get started. I know that you and I know each other very well, but listeners do not. So tell us a little bit first, what got you into the entertainment industry and what brought you to Hong Kong and which came first? Well, the entertainment industry is something that's been in my family for multiple generations, set builders, opera singers, stage performers. And so I knew from a young age I was going to go into the theatre. And then I kind of went a little bit off piste and went and did absolutely everything else associated with in all the peripheral industries before coming back to it. So actually, when I came out to Hong Kong was back in the 80s. It was a, a, a huge period of unemployment in the UK and the arts industry has always been one with a high unemployment rate at the same time and I was a young woman going into what I thought was going to be stage management so I took a little break and came over to Hong Kong to visit with family and ended up staying. And staying since then so how many years in Hong Kong now? Yeah 30 36 years. (laughs) Amazing and so what what was the evolution of coming from that background in the UK and then getting started in Hong Kong uh, and starting your career in the arts and entertainment within this part of the world? So when I first came to Hong Kong, there used to be two arts festivals. There was a Fringe Festival and there was the Hong Kong Arts Festival. And as soon as I came, I did what most people in the industry do. I got a job in a, a bar. And at the same time, I was doing freelance work. And it was a very small industry. And particularly if you're looking at Asia, you've got a, a larger industry that is Cantonese or, or Mandarin speaking, and then a much smaller niche within that of people who straddle both both sides and work in English language as well. So as happens, I networked. So I would pick up work with stage managers and producers and directors, and I would get jobs on festivals. Then I did the unthinkable. I started picking up work on rock tours. Um, So I did a number of those. And then I went and worked for freelance for a lighting company because I was fascinated with stage lighting and I don't have a technical background. And so when I say I went off piste, I mean, I really went all around the houses and I did whatever work was available and interesting to me. And I felt 
gave me a new a new area of interest in the industry all the different types of the industry so gradually I built up and then I obviously have my company or an unlimited which is a full production company so there's been quite a there was quite a long period of working in different aspects of production live events touring concerts and what have you before I before I set up my own company amazing and so you've worked all around asia which cuz hong kong's a very small location considerably and but it's a great hub for the greater asia region Yes. And so tell us a little bit about, you know, is there been a favourite of yours of a crazy project that you've done? And give us a couple of examples because I, I know a few of them. So give us an example <laughs> of some crazy things you've done around this place, uh, Hong Kong or otherwise. Yeah. Um, well, we, I don't know how quite how we ended up getting ourselves into into a certain type of production, but everybody else was nice and comfortable in like convention centres and ballrooms, and we were on rooftops and mountains and underpasses. Oh, crikey, crazy story. So we did a filming project. We worked on a feature film. I went over with my my team to work on a feature film in Vietnam, and we were up in the hill stations. There were wild horses walking through the film set, shot for 48 hours straight without any sleep. I was working, there was one British actor in the film. And so when we turned up, he was very excited to see us and we were talking, but he was literally being given his Vietnamese dialogue sentence by sentence right before going on camera. We have done. Well, as you mentioned earlier on, we had Louis Vuitton, which was in the Forbidden City many, many years ago. So that's super- yeah. Tell us about that. And oh, crikey, I can't even think of it. I tell you what, if we weren't not doing this podcast, I'd be able to come up with a million great, funny examples of projects. <laughs> yeah. Um, what yes. was it like to do to work in the Forbidden City? Was there was it a challenge to get everything? into that location and do an event there? Um, I think working in China in general is a challenge because it's a completely different way of working and there's a lot of fluidity there. And, of course, going back that far, um, for all those projects in those early years, production wasn't as built up as it is now in terms of the eco- you know, the ecology of the, the performance industry at a global scale is different. So in the run-up to the Winter Olympics, there was a huge surge of production companies and suppliers moving into the China market from Hong Kong. So you suddenly had that commonality in the language and the way we work and how we stage and and produce shows. But before that, there was a definite, there was, there was, there was no commonality between it. Our performing arts industries and our events industries were miles apart. So that's the biggest challenge. But also it's the last minute changes. You know, so you'll suddenly get something quite shocking. You know, you've done all of your pre-production based on we're going to be in this venue and at the last minute, actually we've changed our minds. You're not going to be in the palace. You're going to be in the courtyard. And so you have to get a whole load of trucks with a whole load of ground support and canopies made up and, you know, travelling cross-country to get there in time. So, yeah, be ready for everything and anything. What sort of advice would you give people that are going to work in a new country and preparing for, you know, a show or an event in a new country they haven't worked in? Like, what, what, what do you do to make sure that you're ready for that you know because there's cultural differences or processes that may you may not be aware of and how how do you mitigate that in the planning and uh, preparation 100 percent, it's having a local production company so it's a little bit like international film productions you know you get a lot of hollywood movies that shoot in asia or shoot in you know shoot overseas and they will always have a local production company as their local co you know co-production partner because you cannot prepare for working in an international market. You cannot prepare for working in a foreign country to the degree that most of us in production want to be prepared. So it's finding a good local line producer, project manager, production director, and leaning heavily on them. And always be prepared for 
I always put 20% contingency on everything, on time, on money, on resources, on staff, everything, because there, there is also what happens a lot here is uncontrolled expansion, particularly in commercial projects where people get very excited the closer you get to the production and suddenly you have this expectation that you can double your floor size or the stage show can become bigger. And so I think it's always good to have like a um, one backstop position to be able to wheel in all the extras that you need. Mm, interesting. So what's your creative process like for pitching to some of these high-end clients that you've worked for? Because it's a that's the corporate world, but you're bringing, you know, arts and creativity to an event that they're doing. So how does that process work for you right up to the point where you push it, pitch it to their, to, their, to their boss? Yeah, that's a really good question, Anna. I would say that the way I approach it is exactly the same way you, you would approach it if you were be- being given a script for a play. So at the end of the day, there are, there are similarities between working for a commercial project and working in theatre. Because at the end of the day, the commercial project also has a narrative. They have something they want to say about themselves or what they're offering, what their product is. And so my first approach to the to working with commercial clients is actually what are they trying to say? What are they telling you? What's What do we think is hidden behind that? What's in between the lines of what they're asking you? And then in the same way you would treat a play, you look for the right mediums to then tell that story in the best way possible. And so if you start with narrative, and if you're good at understanding narrative and observing, because in, you know, in visual and performing arts, your observational skills, your understanding of all sorts of different things, you know, different materials, different scenic, different technical, different uh, lighting, gives you all of those skill sets to understand how to how to then take what's on the page and put it into a production. The big difference when you're working in commercial is when you're working in theatre, you're production you're all production people together you're all on the same page you understand the laws of physics what can and can't be done when you work in commercial projects you know you get asked to do an awful lot of things that you know aren't physically possible because the people you're working with don't actually they're not engineers they're not riggers they're not you know they don't understand power and weight loading and all the rest of it so there's a degree yeah so that's how I approach it it is First and foremost, understanding what the brief is and the narrative. And I always think of it as a script. And then the best concept is always the simplest one. I have lots of young designers that come and work for me and everything always gets over fussy and over complicated and far too clever for its own good. And actually, if you've understood the brief, if you've understood the narrative, then the concept is simple to put into place but then every decision because because the challenge for us is a little bit more of if I work for brand A and then I go and work for brand B they all want to be better than each other so their metrics of success is it's bigger it's better it's more exciting it's you know it's wowier there's more champagne And actually, one of the things I've done really a lot is I've actually flipped that around and said, let's pull it back. Let's make it smaller, more intimate, more interesting, um, more exclusive. So so that's the other the danger when you're coming up with these concepts for corporate clients is to be led down, you know, the rapids and getting out of control of these big burgeoning shows and then actually pulling it back and then delivering something really sexy and exciting and original and different. Yeah, I think that's the same to do with theatre. Bigger is not always better. It's good that it comes back to the art art of it, right, and then and how on point you are with, with any show. And some of the best shows in the world have been very low budget. So yeah, um, you're right. How is it that you, because um, I, I know your work, how is it you have the conversation, because a lot of brands like Louis Vuitton and, 
Alexander McQueen, they have a brand and they have a style and they have their logo and they they want to have a lot of control over how that's presented and how that's put out there. Whereas you like to take their, I guess their their brand and put it in unusual circumstances. And what's that? <laughs> what's that conversation like to get them to be a little bit more creative with what is usually a very strict brand guideline? So when I've worked with a lot of these brands, there's an annual calendar of projects, and those are fixed. So you've got your spring, summer, big fashion shows. You've got your big media catwalk shows. You've got the small presentations, the trunk shows. And so take Chanel, for instance, Karl Lagerfeld designs everything. And your job as the as the production company is to execute that. So you have to take the design concept and all of the motifs and be as true to that as you possibly can. But when you work with a brand like that, and you do you so you do a number of projects where where you're within the brand guidelines and then every year every every other year you do something that is not part of their calendar their their fashion calendar of standard events and you do something big or exceptional so the Chanel mobile art then again that was it's an again it's it's understanding the narrative so Chanel put together this big art project and they brought together 21 uh, amazing famous people who were artists or actors and they all had to design an artwork so they were doing this touring show Zaha Hadid had designed this enormous one-off space and Hong Kong was the launch event so that went onto the rooftop of the car park on the harbour front in Hong Kong and then we had to design the party the global launch party on the floor below and that's where you get to be playful and then so of course the way that concept comes is you well it's a touring it's a touring art show so then we made everything based on packing crates and containers and we made Chanel you know like the big um, ratchet straps that you tighten loads onto the backs of lorries we made those. So there is there is a point of contact between their brand guidelines and what you're doing in the end. It hasn't been designed by Karl Lagerfeld. It's been designed by you. But you're able to take, and this is the thing about creativity, you're able to take all the component molecules, uh, understand why they're important to the brand, and then rearrange them and interpret them for a completely fresh, finished product. So I think the first thing is understanding understanding the brand and their guidelines and their story and their narrative so you can then, you know, extrapolate that into a new concept. But there's always respect for the brand at the beginning of it. And now a note from our sponsor. The Theatre Out Live podcast is proud to be sponsored by Clearcom. Clearcom is the leader in voice communications since 1968 for theatre and the performing arts. When the show must go on, Clearcom is there to keep the team on cue. You can find them at C-L-E-A-R-C-O-M dot com. Go check them out. I really, I really like that. I think it's um it's something that is really important as as uh, as people do events is not to is to push people out of their boundaries, right, and and get them to do things that they wouldn't normally do. And so, when when you um, how long does that process? So just so people understand, from a in, in the event world, it's a little bit different in terms of timelines. Say for a project like the Chanel project, how long does that design and uh, pitch phase take for you? And then from that point to a delivery, what's the normal sort of time frame of those events that happen well that project had a six month lead time on it um because it was a very big project and it was a global tour so the project in terms of the touring art show had a had been had been in production and inception for a long time so then for the brief and the pitch for the for the opening event in hong kong the big kickoff party to actually building it, that was six months. But in the live event world, we work from, you know, three months up to six months is a sort of a standard time frame, concept to completion. Sometimes we have longer, sometimes we have shorter. And I, I have done 
big shows on shorter shorter than three months lead time challenging but fun sometimes actually sometimes it's better when you have a shorter period because there's less faffing around people can't meddle around as much you can kind of if you come up with a cracking idea then you can race through on the execution and you have a lot more freedom because nobody's playing at being theatre producer with you Mm, mm. and so how does uh orient unlimited get how do you get involved in those works how is is how do those clients reach out to you or how do people um or how do you get those jobs well in the old days it was word of mouth um so we were kind of like that team that you could only find in a leap year on a full moon if you knew the passcode was bob you know <laughs> we, <laughs> we didn't market ourselves and it, it really was word of mouth and remembering going back to those days there was there was relatively few players it's very stratified it's very stratified you know in terms of there's a f- there was only one or two production companies that were doing the really big shows. And it was us and one or two other companies back then. There was lots of production houses doing backdrops and basic stage conferences and things like that, but very few people that were willing to kind of do these very big, detailed, produced shows. So that was word of mouth. And we tend to develop relationships with people rather than brands. So what happens is somebody works here and they leave that company and they go somewhere else and they tend to take their production team with them because it's actually big cachet for them. When you're delivering shows that are getting lots of media attention and you develop that relationship, it's the same as all production. Once you've got over the honeymoon period, like the first show you do with a whole new production crew or a new director and new actors, you're all getting to know how each other work so so and that's the same from from commercial events and client side there's their jobs can be riding on these events so if their their job is riding on these events it's absolutely important for them that they've got a good production company and a good creative director working with them. So that's how you that's how our business built was we're the safety net for our clients. We we basically are able to support them in their, you know, in each of the companies they work in. So that's how the business built up. It's it's the same as production on any show. The first time you work with people, it's a little bit scary. It can be quite challenging. It can be risky. You know, is that director going to be good? Is that act, lead actor going to be good? There's all sorts of unknowns. So once you find a good production company, and also from our side, when we find a good client, you want to keep each other because they're so stressful live events because – there's usually a time constraint, there's usually a venue constraint, there's usually a budget constraint, and you've got to thread the eye of a needle. And so you want to do it with people that you feel you work well with. So that client production partnership relationship is super important. And that's and that's that's the interesting thing. So and I have had the situation where one luxury brand wanted to work with us and then they but we were working not with the Hong Kong team we were working with the head office in Milan and they wanted references from other clients so we had to go to luxury and they and they specified two other luxury companies and when we went to our clients there they went we don't want to give you references we don't want you working with them (laughs) (laughs) so uh, good. they're being protect they be protective stay with us yeah <laughs> absolutely absolutely no. so it's word of mouth yeah no it's it's interesting because uh and it's still it's still like that now in terms of the projects because I, I guess because also hong kong's a very small place in terms even though it's, no, it's global different and, now it's changed well, yeah. a lot so the difference is is and this is how asia is changing and our world so there there has a has been a big shift in asia where you've seen a lot a lot of the 
traditional regional director of marketing has been someone from head office countries, so from France or Italy or the States or wherever. It's now become somebody from Asia. So it's somebody from Hong Kong, China, Japan, Korea, wherever. And there has also become, there's also, so, so some of those relationship based projects, client, client production has changed a little bit. But what you also see was there was almost like a moment, it's like a chain of command thing where there's been a couple of significant interruptions to service. So obviously the global financial crisis, we've had COVID and the pandemic. So a lot of clients have had a big shift in who their staff are, how they place resources around the region, whether their head office is in Hong Kong or in China. So and and then what's happened is a lot of people have have shifted. It's been a big game of musical chairs and some of those relations relationships are being broken. But what's happened is we created the playbook for the kind of work that is possible to do in live events. And that's a very tempting target. So I have a website and, and people, you know, and literally I could see all these young companies opening up and sometimes people who'd worked for us or worked in the industry or come in from overseas, basically going after, going after our client base. And a lot of people also are online and social media, so they connect in that way. So, so you've gone from the old school of you do a job, people talk about it. You, you know, you work with the client or, you know, the lighting director on that project then recommends you for something else. That networking way of working has changed a little bit. Um, a lot of clients are using, I think, people within their teams to Google and search things online. And that's not the best way to find the best resources because anybody can say anything on their website or their social media. And so you've lost some of you've lost some of that. But at the same time, the projects have scaled differently. So we used to have every year, and and it's I'm gonna say something that's gonna sound a bit strange, but for Hong Kong being such a small country, the biggest shows for a lot of the brands were here. Because there's a higher per capita of millionaires and billionaires here than anywhere else in the world. And then you look at the China market, which was massive. I mean, I remember doing being in Taiwan with Chanel and something crazy like fine jewellery sales in Taiwan is bigger than all of the rest of the world put together. You know, so... So actually, while you think that the bigger shows or the, the investment in these big live events would be in Paris and London and New York, the big traditional capitals of luxury, where the actual money goes on the big, big shows has been for the last 20 years in Asia, because they're developing markets with huge wealth coming in, a really fast growing middle and upper class so, you know, so this is where the change is. This, these are the new and emerging markets, and that's where the money was. What's happened is, as a result of that and the Winter Olympics in China, an awful lot of production companies came in from international, and then a lot of local companies, younger companies opened up. Because it always, you know, I'm sure you've had this in conversations. From the outside, what we do looks so exciting and fun. The difference between the live events industry and the theatre industry is people think they can do live events who would never do theatre, you know. So you do get a lot of challenges. You do get a lot of people who get investment together and go, you know, I know a DJ, woohoo, I can be an event person. And so there's a lot of competition. Funnily enough, I'm looking at the market now and going, they're all gone. They haven't actually stood the test of time and all the big companies that came in have gone again. So it has changed significantly. And for me also, I've kind of slightly, I've kind of swerved. You know, I said I went off piece at the beginning of my career and I'm kind of going finally back round to doing more theatre, more film, more visual and performing arts. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. But it's, you know, it's the, 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 our industry is a reflection of the culture anyway. And, uh, and you've got part of our role in, in it is to be adaptable and flexible to as, as where the focus and attention changes, right? So you've got to yes. roll with it. You cannot get up. It, it's interesting that you say all that, but you, I don't sense any, there's no, you're not being upset by all of those changes. You're talking about no. them quite matter of factly, right? That, that you, if you've been in, in the industry for 36 years, then you're going to see some changes. <laughs> right. And I actually think change is good. So I actually think that it can be very dangerous if you're only in one type of production or if you're an artist and you only do one type of medium or one type of thing, you, you know, or I go and do talks at, at colleges and schools and I always talk about my going off piece, not as a bad thing, not as a mistake, but as a rich, as a pathway to accumulating lots of very diverse, diverse experience and points of view. And then at the end, when you're producing or being the creative director, you've got so much more to draw on. So your work is never, you know, it's never running in a linear path of I did this, I did that. All of the group people before me have done this and I'm in the next step. You've always, you're pulling in things from left field and right field and your work becomes more original because it has got a little bit of street in it or it has got a little bit of fashion or a little bit of music or a bit of rock and roll or something. If you're, some, It's great to be purist. Some people do it really, really well. But actually, sometimes if you've, if you've had a little bit of a fruity path and done lots of different things, it, it kind of, I think it enriches your mental database of ideas and concepts and inspirations. Yeah, I would agree. And I think, you know, I've had a similar <laughs> fruity uh, career in terms of dancing between um, industries and projects. And, and I draw from, I do actively draw from certain experiences back in the theatrical world or back out into an event world or into the circus world. It's, it's having that diversity is such a gift and it takes time to build that up. That's the other thing. If people yeah. are impatient in a career um, to be successful quickly, that's not, that's not the path in in the arts it's 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 a long one it's a long play yeah. it's the marathon <laughs> yeah yeah so we always finish our podcast with two questions so I'm gonna ask you these two questions to wrap it up um what do you like most about your job or the industry you can answer say it about your job or the industry whichever one you would like to answer I think what I like about my job is I think that people who work in our industry, there's a certain way of thinking and acting and being. And so it's being part of that community and constantly being challenged. I what I love, what I love about my job is that I can walk away from any part of it at any given time. That's the beauty of what we do is you work on a show, you work with a client, you work on a film, it has a finite period of time, and you have the ability to flip. So when I look at friends of mine who are architects, then they're doing air conditioning and ducting and wall partitions for like 10 years before they actually build anything. What I like is the quick turnaround and the ability to go, that was really fun. I wanted, now I want to do this or now I want to do that or I never want to touch that again. And you have that <laughs> ability with the fast changing and also on each project working with different people. So... So you have a little bit of security the longer you go on doing it because you've done so many things. You have you've have that personal safety net of I know what my limits are. But, yeah, it's the quick turnarounds. Well, that's a, that's a, I have never heard that answer in our podcast. I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> if you could change one thing about your job or the industry, what would it be? If I could change one thing about our industry – um, there's one thing I'm slightly starting to see, which I'd like to change. You know, I'd like us to kind of take a swerve out of it, which is as, you know, as we go on decade by decade, all of all of the disciplines within our industry are becoming, you know, PhDs. Everybody invests like five years, goes to university, studies, you know, rock tour management, event management. Um, and what that does, I think, a little bit 
is it it can start to constrict you into a lane so you go to you know, you go to college or you go to academy and you're and it's the same for architecture and and any of those courses you become part of a very specific tribe and you have a certain a similar education background and then we have this digital domain now where everybody has access to pinterest and and people are getting the cart before the horse you know they're forgetting to build up their own original database and so every and so i'm seeing it a lot i'm seeing a slight homogenous approach you know because everybody's seen the same posts and pictures and mood boards and something so what i'd like to change about our industry is and it's funny because obviously vivian westwood just passed away a few days ago and i went quirky out there pioneer like a great and i think that I'm mourning the loss of a generation that's older than me, who we're starting to lose, who did something because it was a passion, not a career. I can't quite describe that, but people who literally went from doing one thing over into being a rock band manager or a stagehand or a scenic artist, you know, as an almost quirk of fate, and then and then flourished and were fabulous at it. So I think if I could change one thing, I would in our industry, I would like to see more cross pollination. I would like to see more practical within within these streams. I would like to see more of this sort of multidisciplinary from education through and a lot more practical because I don't think I, I think there's too I think there's become too much emphasis on I I do this for three years and I've got a diploma in my hand and I therefore am. And I think I'm I'm in my 50s now and I still think I'm on the journey to being who I am. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. We need more rebellious Vivian Westwoods is what you're saying. Exactly. <laughs> I'm trying. Westwood. I'm trying really hard. <laughs> I think you've got a. I think you've got a, a little bit of rebelliousness in you. I've seen you work. So, <laughs> Joseph, Josephine, thank you so much for spending some time with us today on the Theatre Art Life podcast. It's been a real pleasure to share with you your experience here, the, the world, your experiences, and and what I know about you. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I really appreciate it. Theatre Art Life is a global media site for entertainment. Memberships start at only thirty eight US dollars per year. You can have unlimited access to our daily published articles, including entertainment news and the writings of active industry professionals, ensuring that you are always up to date on the global happenings in the world of entertainment. Become a part of the international entertainment community and join us now at www.theaterartlife.com.